You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. There are some people in the world who you like right away because they not only have brilliant ideas, but they are also genuinely interested in listening to what others have to say. My guest today is one such person who has inspired me and whom I have greatly enjoyed hanging out with over the years at Stanford. Steve Krasner has for decades been one of the most influential international relations scholars in the world. He is the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Relations and a senior fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute and the Hoover Institution. In 2002, Steve served as Director for Governance and Development at the National Security Council. And from 2005 to 2007, he was Director of Policy Planning at the U.S. State Department. In this conversation, Steve and I discussed the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the fragmented global order, and how differences in national power and interests, not international norms, continue to be the most powerful explanation for the behavior of states. We thereafter focused our attention on his latest book, How to Make Love to a Despot, where he argues that because prosperous democratic nations are exceptions in international politics, the United States ought to adopt policies acceptable to despotic rulers. This means coming to terms with the good enough governance of non-democratic governments rather than trying to consolidate democracy around the world. For those interested, we have provided a transcript of the conversation, which touched upon a range of issues, from the principle of sovereignty and U.S. involvement in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Venezuela, to what Steve means by good enough governance. I'm always very grateful for your feedback. Please continue to send me your comments and suggestions and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. You're also welcome to tag us on social media and write a review. Thank you. It should not come as a big surprise that I'm a huge fan of your work and I have uh, enjoyed talking with you about all kinds of issues over the years. So it's a great pleasure for me to have you on the show. Welcome. So thank you. Thanks for taking the time. And it's good to see you again, too. So, Steve, you are, of course, one of the big gurus of IR, international relations. So I have to start by asking you, to reflect a bit on the current situation as you see it. So we have a major war going on at the moment between Russia and the Ukraine. Influential IR scholars, some of your colleagues have been claiming that it's the US's fault, it's our fault, it's the Western powers that were trying to you know, expand NATO that has caused this war that Russia was really upset. And of course, many others disagree with that point of view. But amidst all of this talk, there is a lot of focus I see on this principle of sovereignty and global governance appears to be fragmented and the world looks pretty chaotic as I see it now. So given that you're one of the most influential and well-respected scholars in this field, Steve, how would you characterize the field of international relations today? I think the situation is very problematic. And I think the problem comes from this combination of sovereignty and the industrial revolution. Let's say we went back 50 years or 100 years and everybody had taken advantage of the industrial revolution. I think the world would actually be quite stable. In fact, I think what's happened, hey, you have this notion of sovereignty. It's sort of a crazy idea. Grew up originally in Europe over a long period of time. And I think states that became sovereign states in Europe were either large and powerful, or they were like Switzerland, able to, or Norway even, able to defend themselves. Oh, Norway, you can see, has had some mixed success. So I think what happened is, you know, this principle of sovereignty was adopted all over the world. You know, by the end of Colossus in 1960s, the idea that states should be able to defend themselves was kind of out the window. Everybody got recognized, which was great if you were a lead in one of these states. 
So I think what's happened is you now have a world in which you have a lot of very weak states, especially in Africa, but even in Europe, the, say the Baltic countries or Ukraine, which can't defend themselves. At the same time, they haven't really industrialized, especially in Latin America and Africa. And that's very problematic. So you've got a lot of weak states unable to defend themselves in a situation in which they can be invaded by the neighbors. So it's true, Russia has not invaded the Baltic states, probably because they're members of NATO, and it's not worth the risk. But that's not a really stable situation. You know, Russia could easily dominate its neighbors. The United States, I mean, look, could easily dominate its neighbors. In Canada, we don't care. But Mexico, we failed on. And I think it makes the migration process unsolvable. You know, if I lived in Guatemala, I'd try to get to the U.S. If I lived in tropical Africa, I'd certainly try to get to Europe. And, you know, that's because these are places that are poor, they're weak, and it's really an incentive for individuals to move. So I think if you look at the migration issue, which has been a big deal in the U.S. and even in Europe, you know, it's very understandable why lots of people are moving. Yeah. Now, let's say that, that tropical Africa was rich, or Guatemala was as rich as the United States. I think you'd have no issue. You know, but, and even if you go back to like the 1880s, 1850s, you know, the biggest gap in per capita income was like four to one. I mean, now it's, you know, 100 to one. So at 100 to one, people are willing to leave. At four to one, they're not that anxious to leave. So in this world in which it's easy, much easier to move around, at least in the industrial world, you can get, you can get any place in 24 hours not true in the past. And it's not true if you go back to sort of the beginning of the United States in 1760s or 1800s. Places were more or less the same. It's hard to move, and it wasn't worth it. Now it's easy to move, and it's very much worth it. So I think the natural system is, you know, highly problematic. And in some ways, if we look at the traditional Chinese system, in which China was the center, everybody else was a tributary state, it actually makes more sense. You've written so many books, and you've been very good at finding really catchy titles. I love the one, Sovereignty, Organized Hypocrisy. That title itself, when you read that title, you know what you're basically going to say. So I wanted to request you to reflect a bit on this, because a lot of observers, when you wrote the book, but even now are questioning the, the viability of the sovereign state particularly because of the acceptance of human rights, minority rights, the role of the World Bank, financial institutions, globalization, you name it. But you've argued that the presence of these norms, these longstanding norms, are frequently violated. In fact, this is actually an enduring feature of international relations. Is that still the case? It's not the international norms. It's the differences in national power and interest that continue to be the most powerful explanation for the behavior of states today. How do you see that? I still think that's true. I think in the past, it was not that important. If you look at Europe, I mean, Switzerland is that. For example, a small state, not very wealthy originally, able to defend itself, wasn't worth conquering Switzerland. I mean, you can see what happened to Norway in the Second World War. It was worth the Germans conquering Norway, and they did it pretty easily. I think the problem is now, so I think sovereignty has persisted because it's very much in the interest of leaders to have it persist. So you get to speak at the UN, you get lots of money, you yeah. get prestige, you get wealth, you get all this stuff by being a leader even of a very small and poor state. But I think the gaps have grown worse than they were in the past. So the United States administrator had the opportunity to expand in Central America in the 19th century and did not do it. But it was also the case that I haven't actually looked at this, but my guess is that per capita income in Guatemala and Nicaragua, they were probably less than the U.S., but not that much less. Now they're really less, you know, 10 times less. And so the incentive for people to move is, is greater, and that's very destabilizing. 
the international system, as you have often written about, is, is full of anarchy. There is no authoritative actor that can prevent one state from pursuing foreign policy objectives by changing the domestic authority structures or by influencing those leaders down there or domestic forces elsewhere. And yet, Steve, at the moment, you mentioned migration. The big talk these days is climate change, is addressing global public goods, preventing the next pandemic. How are we in a position, you think, to provide this? Is it possible? Because global public goods are supposed to be non-excludable. It should apply to everyone. It's not just something that the United States finances for itself. It should also benefit China. It should be enjoyed by everyone without diminishing the benefits that they deliver to others. So there's this non-rival aspect. If we go back to sovereignty and realism, people looking out for their own interests, it is power that is important. Do you see any hope to address these larger global challenges that require financing for global public goods? Okay, so I admit I don't. You know, take um, the United States. I mean, it was downtown Manhattan. Lower Manhattan was flooded, I think it was 1905. Yeah. Yeah, these are rich people with very expensive real estate and still not much happened. So I'm pretty pessimistic. If you look at something like climate change, well, would I expect India or China to cut back? No, I don't. And I think they have a very good argument. You know, you, you rich people. Yeah, you guys polluted. (laughs) You know, will you actually get significant cutbacks in the U.S.? I would say no. So I would think if you look at climate change in particular, Our best hope is not that we're actually going to arrive at global governance, but I think our best hope is that we'll have technology that may make the problem easier. Yeah, that's what a lot of people say. They're they're putting their hopes on technology. That's what I hope too, because I don't see the political system working. I mean, would an American president adopt policies, let's say, doubling the price of gasoline? It will never happen. Because you, you see that um, while the impact may be global, the elections are national or local. Exactly. So I think if the U.S. gets you know, more efficient wind, better solar, better batteries, that's our best hope. But I'm very pessimistic that we'll be able to arrive at an agreement that would you know, make at a global level very pessimistic. But we have had some uh, progress, Steve. I mean, you know, countries do sign treaties. Sometimes they are binding, and and you could have you could constrain the that the power of these states, right? You could get them to act in the in the global interest sometimes, but you don't see that happening in terms of preventing the next pandemic, for example. Right. So I think that you've been able to do that when it's pretty cheap. And easy to do. So if you look at the Montreal Climate Accord in 1987. It's easy to get rid of Freon because you had a substitute gas. Do I see it happening now? I'm pretty pessimistic about it happening now. Let's uh, get cracking this fantastic book that you've written. Again, another fantastically catchy title, How to Make Love to a Despot, an Alternative Foreign Policy for the 21st Century. Steve, You are arguing in this book that the United States must actually stop doing what it is doing, trying to remake the world according to its own image, and must learn how to make love to despots, how to get not good governance, but good enough governance. Right. Tell us a bit more, especially why should we not strive for the best possible outcome? Democracy, good governance. Why should we settle for second best? But I don't know what the second best actually looks like, or even the U.S. can do it. But the U.S. was very successful after in 1945. You know, Germany, Japan, and plus Western Europe, very successful. And it's totally failed since then. I mean, Korea sort of became a democracy, but it had lots of foreign aid. Um, it was a dictatorship until 1989. Very hard to do. And if you look at neighbors of the U.S., well, 
you know, Canada has been very successful, but look at Mexico and every every place else. It's very hard to do. So I think if you look at democracy, you know, I take, you know, it's true that it's a great form of government and it seems to work very well. It doesn't necessarily mean that it can happen. And I think for the U.S. in particular, it's very influenced by Britain in the 17th century, what happened in Britain. So the king had his head cut off. You had the dictatorship Oliver Cromwell for a decade. That failed. Parliament invited the Stuarts back, then threw the Stuarts out in 1688 and invited some new people. But I think the lesson to be drawn from that is that democracy works if you, A, have deep divisions in society, and B, both sides see that they can't possibly win. You know, if you think you can win, if you're a dictator in, say, Guatemala or Venezuela, I think you'll try to win. So that's the trouble. You know, if you look at the record of the U.S. historically, you know, it did great after World War II when Germany and Japan were totally destroyed, but it's done pretty badly otherwise. Well, some of the problems, as I see it, Steve, is that the U.S., when it sort of preaches democracy, or that applies actually to a lot of Western countries, the reaction is pretty swift because, you know, people say, look at your own uh, country, look at your own system, it's dysfunctional, look at racism, look at all these other problems that you have, why are you pointing fingers at us? Right, so look, I agree with that. So I think racism is a deep problem, deep, deep problem in the U.S., and it's true that things have changed, you know, if, well, you're not here anymore, but if you look, even in the last five years, you see many more interracial couples on TV. But it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if trickle down works, it would be great. But at the same time, you know, the gap in income, gap in wealth between blacks and, and other people, whites in the U.S. has grown. I think the U.S. does have real failings. But I think the deeper problem is we, we have this sort of myth in the U.S. that we, you know, support democracy and freedom, um, which we haven't always lived up to, obviously. But the problem is making democracy and freedom work in other parts of the world turns out to be very difficult. Leaders in other parts of the world know their countries better than we do. So I, when I was in government in 2006, I was very, very enthusiastic about it. A uh, Norwegian initiative, which was attempting to make an, an effort to better govern raw materials. Or well, the EITI? EITI, right. So Norway put a lot of money into it. it. Seemed to me like a great idea. What was the first country to be certified by EITI? Azerbaijan. Oh. Totally corrupt. Now, they did get thrown out eventually, but it turns out. You know, if you were one Aliyev or Aliyev's son, you wanted to run Azerbaijan, you were able to fix things, so you qualified with the ITI, but were you really able to change the regime? Probably not. So I think it's a great it's a great idea. I was very enthusiastic about it, and it just didn't work. It's very you know, it's, it's very the trouble for the US is that you have this myth of democracy. Which is what really is motivated the country, you know, motivated the country. But it's very hard to get democracy in other places. I'm thinking about, you know, when I remember all those years ago when you and I did the MOOC on what works, promising practices in international right. development, we taught this course. And I remember you in one of the lectures saying that modernization theory has failed, institutional capacity approaches are flawed, and these cannot really explain how and why economic growth takes place. And modernization theory, for example, you've been arguing cannot explain how economic growth begins. Institutional capacity approaches can't explain why a powerful state like the U.S. would not be self-serving. So talking about democracy promotion, Steve, what happened with democracy promotion and U.S. involvement in Iraq? 
in Afghanistan? Because these are seen to be failed attempts. And I see that in the book, that is your one of your main arguments saying that, look, I was there, it didn't work. And you were a, a key part of some of these decisions in the George W. Bush presidency. So talk us through what happened with these U.S. efforts. Right. So I think that Bush was absolutely sincere. You know, so you'd get democracy in Afghanistan, so you'd get democracy in Iraq. Theoretically, it made sense. Say Iraq could become democratic and grown quickly. Would you have an Iran problem? No, Iraq would be a beacon of light. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more pessimistic than I was when we originally taught the course because many of these things have been tried and they, they failed. I mean, I thought they would be successful and they haven't been. I thought, you know, if you had external governments, that would be great. That would work. I think our policy towards China from like 1970 to 2020 was very much guided by binary Asia theory. We thought China would become rich, it would get a bigger middle class, the middle class would be democratic, and China would become democratic. In fact, that is not what, you know, China stayed Chinese. So I think we, this idea that you could have extra government that would work, I think it's turned out to be really hard to do. And I can't find anything that was dramatically successful. You know, I thought 10 years ago it would work, is that anymore? So, uh, you know, one of the things I find fascinating, of course, with you and some of our other Stanford colleagues is that you've also been in the policymaking business and you've returned to academia. You've had all of these stints. You were the director for policy planning in the State Department in 2005. And as I understand it, Steve, over the years, of course, you've you've written about this, you've talked about this, that President George W. Bush was initially focused on domestic issues. And in the 1990s, of course, and until 2001, there was a lot of optimism about the global order, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the increase in the number of democracies all over the world. Our good friend that we have in common, Frank Fukuyama, was talking about the, the end of history, democracy and free markets, other things, and that would be the legitimate ways or parts for, for prosperity, human well-being. Samuel Huntington was, of course, warning against the clash of civilizations, that it was religion and culture. That would be, you know, crucial. And then 9-11 happened, right? And you were, I think, in the National Security Council at that time, or or and I think I read that you were in Washington and you you saw, I mean, you could see the smoke from the Pentagon. Right. You actually biked to the Potomac River and you right. saw saw that that thing happen. So 9-11 changed everything, right? A new enemy was identified. You had Islamic terrorism, all of that. So how did that land landmark event, 9-11, how did that change American foreign policy? Was there more focus on democracy? Was there now a new enemy? How was it for you to be in the State Department amidst all of this? Right. So I would say initially, because it was there when George Bush was president, there was more focus on democracy. Mm -hmm. And if it had worked, it would have been great. The trouble is we don't have an alternative. So it's fine to say, you know, as I've argued in writing, that we can't get democracy. But what do we substitute for it? You have good enough governance. It's nice, but it's not gonna, people are not going to die for that. So I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I actually don't know. You know, I thought security maybe might work. You know, we have to make ourselves more secure. You know, but that would have meant we go into Afghanistan, beat the crap out of them, and leave. The U.S. didn't do that went into Afghanistan and tried to remake Afghanistan and totally failed. Went into Iraq and tried to remake Iraq and failed. So I think the problem for the U.S. is they have lots of power. You have this governing myth of democracy. You can't actually implement democracy. And the one way my thinking has changed is democracy looked great. You know, countries that were democratic got rich. I can give you a story about why that happened. 
you know, countries that were not democratic state poor. I thought Fukuyama was right. Yeah. And what we've seen in retrospect, and I, I don't think Frank would disagree with this. Yes, you have elections, but they may be fake elections. I spoke with Frank about this, and he says that he underestimated the rise of China. I definitely underestimated the rise of China, but I think more than that, I don't want to claim like in 2010, okay, I thought China would rise, it was rising, but I, man, I think this was true of the American establishment, thought China would be democratic. That has not been the case. And what you'd have to ask is it may be great if you're Chinese and you're sort of looking out. You found the formula that seems to work. Is Xi Jinping going to go to power? I would say no. So I think if you look at US China policy, it's going to depend entirely on what the Chinese do. If they're successful, you know, with an autocratic regime that's actually rich, the US will be in a lot of trouble. I was in Washington in January of this year, and I was surprised at this anti-China rhetoric. It's a whole different bubble in Washington, which I think underestimates the perception in, in other parts of the world, including in Europe. It's this polarized discourse about, you know, it's all about beating China. Whereas many countries, including some of the countries I study, Steve, in, in Africa, they don't want to take sides. <laughs> they, they want to do business with both. So, so right. I don't understand why there's this one-sided focus, the China bashing focus in the U.S. It continues. And I was shocked, too. The U.S. changed and changed very quickly. But I think in the past, we, as I said, we thought China would be rich and, and become democratic. Yeah. And being rich and still autocratic, even more autocratic, it's not what the U.S. expected. You know, once we saw that China was going to be an enemy, perceived as an enemy and not perceived as a friend, it's very problematic. So, you know, look at Taiwan and get back to sovereignty a little bit. You know, they, they've had many war games in, of the U.S. against China, and China always wins. So will the U.S. be able to defend Taiwan? I would say probably not. You know, well, the Chinese, they don't have to invade Taiwan. They could just lob some rockets in and hurt it should be. So uh, I think that's highly problematic. So in this world, was great for the U.S., which, of course, we didn't see. And here, you know, this army, which is able to overthrow anybody, anywhere. We view ourselves, the U.S. views ourselves as being benign. You know, if you were an African leader, you would be sort of in the back of your mind a little bit worried, right? I've also chatted with Joe Nye about soft power, which is, of course, what he would say the U.S. has more of than China, that winning right. hearts and minds. But, you know, even there, if I'm to be honest, Steve, I, I don't see, I feel like the U.S.'s soft power is on the wane when one has this very harsh rhetoric. It's, it's declining. Even the soft power is declining because one is not, seeing the world as many other countries are seeing. Okay, I think that you're basically right. So I think, where did the soft power of the U.S. come from? came from culture that seems very strong. But I think it's been very hard for the U.S. to see, look, if you're a military, it can overthrow anybody, anywhere. That makes people nervous. Now, the Americans would say, well, yes, it's true, we could overthrow anybody, but we've been quite restrained, which I think is actually sort of true. But it, it's not going to cover other people. They'll still be very nervous about the U.S. Talking about good enough governance, you identify certain criteria, and I have this in front of me good enough governance would have some of these following characteristics. One is that the uh, public authorities would be able to provide some form of public order and security, that uh, there might be rule by law, not necessarily rule of law. There would be some economic growth, if not sustained growth, at least the level of wealth that could be achieved would be limited by certain incentives, et cetera, but there would be some growth. Now, I find it interesting where you 
also point out that some form of corruption has to be tolerated. You can't get rid of all forms of clientelism and patronage. And uh, the state is able to provide a reasonable amount of public services. And then elections would be used, used to legitimate agreements that had been reached ex ante among political elites. So these are some of the features of good enough governance. What would you highlight as the most central aspect here? Is it elections? Is it corruption? Is it political settlements? What is key for you? Or all of these, perhaps? Well, I, I don't have a good answer. So I would say the critical thing is that elites want to stay in power. That may mean rigging elections. It almost certainly means corruption. I think the fundamental problem is the U.S. has this sort of myth that we, yes, we'd fight and we'd spread democracy. Would people fight for good enough governance? That's been my problem. And I don't have a good, I think they won't fight for good enough governance. It may be a catchy phrase, not mine, Stone <laughs> for somebody at Harvard, but it doesn't mean that people will fight and die for it. So if you look at fighting and dying, you fight and die for democracy. Well, what happens if you can't get democracy? And that's a problem which the US has not solved. You have this sort of myth on the one hand, good enough governance, it may, it may be accurate. I think it actually is accurate, but it doesn't mean that people would fight and die for good enough governance. What I really enjoyed in the book is you point to two aspects that the U.S. should do more of. One is being more humble. The role of humility is, is crucial. And also addressing false expectations. We have these high expectations. We always want the best possible outcomes. But in reality, it doesn't turn out the way we thought it would. So I think, you know, you'd have to I mean, look at the U.S. in the last Vietnam War, you've had a lot of unsuccessful wars. Has the U.S. really changed? I would say no. That, I think, is a fundamental problem, that we have these high expectations, and they're consistently disappointed. And they will be disappointed. Why will it be disappointed? Because they said gaining democracy actually turns out to be quite hard, much harder than I thought. And simply saying, well, we have a democracy, and the democracies were great. Forgetting about the uh, feathers of the United States, it turns out to not be enough, right? I mean, it's not enough saying we're great, we're democratic, and we're wealthy. You know, because if you're a leader in, say, Guatemala or Myanmar or wherever, you want to stay in power. That's a critical thing. So, you know, saying empowerment has been great for us. Um, we don't care about other parts of the country. Your argument basically, Steve, is that rather than aiming so high and trying to reach the, you know, let's reach the treetop rather than aiming sky high. And right. maybe by reaching the treetop, we will be able to prevent terrorist attacks, address global problems, maybe address migration, maybe even make life bearable for the people in these countries. Okay, so I, I think that analytically it's correct. Would the U.S. actually be able to act on it? That's what I'm skeptical about. Yeah. So if you went into Afghanistan and you said, this would follow my logic, um, we're going to go in. We'll make sure that Afghanistan is not harboring terrorists. We'll beat them up and then we'll leave. I think it would be hard to do. I mean, I think what, what Bush did actually made more sense to the American public. We're going to go into Afghanistan. We'll make Afghanistan democratic, and that will be great. We're going to act in terms of our own security. We'll go into Afghanistan. We'll beat you up and then we'll leave. Would you actually? I'm not sure that you'd be able to try support for doing that. 
Let's talk a little bit about your uh, experiences being a Peace Corps volunteer in Nigeria all of those years ago. When you went there, you taught English at a school in northern Nigeria. And you and your fellow colleagues had all of these high hopes. And when I read this latest book, Steve, I understand why you're pessimistic, because you're not very pleased with how things turned out in Nigeria. I think if you look at Nigeria, when I was there in 63, 1963, 64, 65, yeah, and look at Nigeria now. I mean, I think in the 1960s, we said, look, we're going to Nigeria. We'll get rid of colonialism. Nigeria will be democratic and it will be rich. And it's certainly not rich. And it hasn't done that well with democracy. I was very typically optimistic in the 1960s. I'm definitely not optimistic now. So I think the American assumption in the 1960s was, look, we'll get rid of colonialism. Each country will be democratic and they'll be just like us. In fact, that hasn't turned turned out like that. What would be a good case for good enough governance? In the book you write about Colombia, well, why is that a good case, Steve? Well, because, you know, Colombia had this civil war for a long time. And there were deep divisions within the country. And, you know, kind of got frozen. It's sort of okay, but not great. And I think we have no idea of how to make it great. That's the problem. I think, um, you know, I think that the progress in Colombia reflects the fact that you know, and fighting between the left and the right had taken place for a long time. The right was willing to make some compromises, but it's the best we can hope for now. See, my problem is that I think, you know, it's fine if you're sitting back in the university saying, mm-hmm. we're going to do A, B, and C. Yeah. But, you know, and this was what will work. It doesn't mean that we'll actually translate into political success. But I think there are good reasons why, Steve, our political leaders talk about human rights, democracy, because they think that's what their voters want to hear. I agree. I think that's right. So you want to hear these things, but see, if you look at the United States, then there are deep divisions. Yeah, okay, I think Trump is a crook. A substantial part of the population will vote for him. And I can sort of understand why, you know, especially this is where being in Oregon has helped. Granted, Ashton is a very liberal place. But, you know, what happens is if suddenly the population becomes, you know, heavily Central American and shocking for people. You know, so it's great if you take Marjorie Taylor Greene. So I've, I've been to Georgia, but not to northwestern Georgia. Yeah, you know, yeah, you had this world in which in the 1950s or 1960s, blacks got off the sidewalks. They don't do that anymore. And for the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, that's pretty shocking. Now, I think it's great, but it's easy for me to say. You know, look at the sort of housing crisis in California. You know, People can be very liberal unless you're going to build any expensive housing next to them. Exactly. <laughs> An example for me of this was in the um, 2000s, I guess, or maybe 1990s. Stanford wanted to build housing on some of its own land that was um, not being used. I think there were like seven houses. And the faculty got up and arm can't do this, it's terrible. We don't want a new house built next to us. And eventually the university backed down. You know, here were people at Stanford who were fairly well off building housing for other Stanford professors. And there's still a huge protest. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's it's fine if it happens far away, it can't happen in our backyard. Right, that exactly. is the problem. Exactly. And, and that's the problem with preaching, you know, in general. But I wanted to also ask you about Venezuela, because that is also an interesting case, right, where the U.S. I'm not really sure what the U.S. was trying to do. So after Chavez died, Maduro came to power. 
and there's been this back and forth and and it's still in limbo so you know is is the us you think trying to make venezuela democratic should it be working with maduro the despot so i don't think the us is working with maduro now as you are trying to make venezuela democratic yes but if you look at the caribbean central america and south america there haven't been that many successes i mean Chile is certainly pretty successful. Brazil is kind of mixed. Argentina is sort of mixed, maybe more successful. But I think the key is to say, you need to work in ways that are political. I think it's sort of simple. So in Venezuela, I think the U.S. is actually pretty stuck. We'd like to get rid of Maduro, but we have no idea how to do it or what would replace him. Because this is something that, again, I know you've been interested in, the role of external actors in state building, right? So this is the whole, we're trying to sort of conclude the story. On my show, I've had lots of guests talking about the role of foreign aid. You know, we want to promote uh, governance, democracy, rights for certain groups. We want to um, improve the livelihoods. We want to combat deprivation. We want to reduce corruption. All of these ideas we have about how we based on our experience, based on our values, can change the world, can help others. I mean, help as in, you know, quotation marks. And, and in many ways, Steve, these are important. Not It's not always like we're trying to help. Maybe we are also doing it for ourselves. There's, that we have a, a self-interest. Some would say there's an enlightened self-interest. So what role do you see external actors playing in state building? What, what role do you see of aid going forward? Basically, I would say small. Yeah, I don't think these things are bad. So I, I wouldn't say that foreign aid is bad or anything like that. But the idea that you would use foreign aid and eventually these countries would be rich and democratic, just like us, that I think is a stretch. So I think the problem is that Political elites in these countries know these countries well. And we can try and come in with good government. It's going to fail. You know, I think good enough governance might be successful, but it will not be easy. So when I say, look, let's not pretend that we can get rid of corruption completely. Is corruption a bad thing? Yes. Do political elites in other countries stay in power because of corruption? I would say yes. So would we actually be able to devise a policy um, that local elites would accept? I think that's very hard. So again, if you look at EITI, I know I put a lot of money into this. I thought when I was in the State Department in 1906, that was a great idea. But you know, as a Leaf going to want to give a power, I would say no. It's going to want to stay here and his family are going to want to stay in power in Azerbaijan. And that will mean a lot of corruption. So I thought it was a great idea. It's just a great idea you couldn't implement because implementing would have meant that the Leaf family would have been committing suicide, which they don't want him to do. So, Steve, a lot of our conversation today has been largely pessimistic. Are there any grounds for optimism going forward? Give us some hope. Give my listeners some, some positive think, news. Right. So I think there may be some optimism within countries, not an international level. So are things getting better in the U.S.? Sure, but it, it's slow, and you can see that progress is hard. You know, and if you look at a global level, it's dropped pretty pessimistic because the real problem is I don't know. You know, this American myth of democracy, which has failed, you know, could it be replaced by something else? I don't know now what that could be. So I think I might, you know, I'm not totally pessimistic about the United States, but, you know, I'm, if Trump wins the next election, I'll be very pessimistic. So I admit, you know, in 2016, I thought his chances of winning were 
Yeah. I know. Everybody was shocked. Yeah. Right. That this guy's a crook. He's from New York. Everybody can see this. But, you know, it's a big country with a lot of people. And you look at things like country control in the U.S. You know, if, I don't know, 20 kids were killed at Sandy Hook, that was more than a decade ago. And the U.S. still hasn't done anything there. So why not? Because there are some people, granted a minority, but some people who really think, you know, having an assault rifle is a natural right. So I think it will change. But, you know, it doesn't I could tell you how my change, but it clearly could some change quickly. I'm thinking about some of the the sort of the positive news in terms of global development. You know, China reducing extreme poverty, India doing pretty well. These new powers are becoming more and more influential. When you were at the State Department in 2005, 2006, 2007, did you foresee this kind of growth that these emerging powers would be so influential so quickly? No, not real. I would say definitely no. But you also thought, look, these countries, especially China, they'll become wealthy. And a wealthy China will be just, as I said before, just like us. And but people absolutely could not see it. So you have the big change that you observed in the US. And say you have a much wealthier China, but they're not like us. So no, that I think you know the transformation, as you'd said in 2006. Well, China will do so well. So you might not have said that, but he might have said that. But he said, if they do do very well, they'll be just like the United States. In fact, that I, the big shock has been they've done very well. That was not so shocking. What is striking is that from being a rule taker, they're becoming more rule makers in, in international, yeah. in, in multilateral settings. There's much more of an effort at reshaping the multilateral system now that China has as its ambition than was the case before. So it's almost like that is what is angering many of the Western powers that many of these other countries like China pushing back and trying to put their people in influential UN positions, trying to change the rules. That, okay, that Western so powers it, were doing for a while. Right. But I think if you look at China, I mean, why they've been able to do these things because they're big and they've been fairly prosperous. So that's why, as, as I said before, if China actually continues to go much faster than the US or Western Europe, they're going to win. There's no way the US is going to be able to stay in you know, the Western Pacific. If in, in 20 or 30 years, if China continues to get wealthy. Now, take the Congo, which is Russia. So Russia's become you know, autocratic under Putin. Its military actually looks much weaker than we expected. You know, we thought Ukraine would fall in two weeks. You know, yeah. instead they're still fighting. You know, is Russia able to remake the international system? I would say no. So I think China's success depends on China's power, which depends on Chinese economic growth. So I do think that Chinese economic growth will falter, but if it does not, then you know, a wealthy autocratic China would certainly be a model that would be very attractive to much of the world. My 17-year-old, Alex, is, by the way, 17 years now. He recently wrote a school essay on uh, some of the major branches of IR theory. And he told me that your name cropped up in his Google search. And then he realized how influential you have been in the field because earlier you were just our family friend. So it was so lovely to see you. Thank you so much for coming on my show today. So good to see you. Thanks for taking the time. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.